Good morning. How's everybody doing? All right. I heard I heard a few coming in tired, but good. I'm in that camp. <laughs> As probably a lot of us are. Um, so this is, I think, this is probably the first time I have presented to a group of people where it's been prefaced with, you get credit for listening to him. So that's a little scary. If, if you're going to get credit for listening to me, you're golden. So um, but anyway, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you guys. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more today about cloud services in general. We'll touch on some of the aspects about you know why to, to choose one versus the other and what they are and what the trends are, both from an industry perspective and a government perspective. So I am 100% okay and actually encourage you to stop me and interrupt, ask questions along the way. And, uh, you know, if there's something that you have a question about here, we'll try to answer, uh, try to answer whatever it is. So don't, uh, don't be bashful about jumping in uh, if you want. And if you'd rather not ask your question in front of everybody, then come up and come up and see me afterwards. But I'll be happy to to chat with you. Um, you know, it's it's interesting if you look at the cloud, overall cloud market and the different segmentations. High level trends are pretty similar across everything. So we'll touch on what the trends are in general. Um, we'll talk about uh, some of the drivers, some of the specifics here, and then. Um, how do you choose, or what are what are some of the reasons why you might or might not? You know, not every different technology is right for everybody. So, okay, basic slide in the beginning. Probably everybody knows what cloud computing is, and probably every single person in this room uses it. Right? Is there anybody in here that doesn't think, in some aspect of your life, that you use something in the cloud? I mean, probably every one of us have got some kind of a smartphone, or you know, so we're using iTunes or downloading apps or Google Play or Google Drive or whatever, and you know that's in the last. I don't know. For me, if I think about my own use of that stuff, you know, probably in earnest was really first when I got my first iPhone and really started thinking about that. And you know, since then I'm a Google Cloud junkie and Amazon Prime junkie. I think I single-handedly keep Amazon in business. Um, but it's all over the place, right? And in general, it's this concept of pushing things into data centers where, where us really have been the driver of it. We want to have access to everything everywhere, and I don't know why we've all suddenly decided we can't be without connectivity somewhere. At some point, we've got to get over that, but that's really the biggest driver of, of what's going on, right? So it's, it's mobility, it's scale, right? The, mo the scale has come with the mobility, because think about you know, all of us in here you know, in our different needs. Uh, trying to get back to our corporate um, entities, right? Hard to do that. Um, but I can very easily, with almost very little connectivity, get to my Google Drive or um, you know, the, uh, my, my, uh, the Microsoft Azure Cloud or any of those kinds of things. So ubiquitous connectivity um, has driven more and more. Yesterday I had a call from, I was driving, I live in Huntsville, Alabama, so I was driving over. It's about a five and a half hour drive or so. and. Somewhere in between Atlanta and Augusta, I got a call from one of the sales guys that said, hey, I really need, really need you to go look at some pricing. We got a deal that's ready. I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm sort of in the middle of nowhere on I-20 at the moment. But when I, if I can pull over you know, and find some place I can get my laptop up and going, I can you know, take care of what you need. So you know, 20 miles later, there's an exit. There's a, I don't remember what all was there. There was a McDonald's and a Starbucks and, ah, Golden, right? One of those, the golden arches saved the day, right? So I pull into the McDonald's parking lot, plenty of Wi-Fi signal, hop on and, you know, do my thing. Um, one of the cloud applications we use is Salesforce.com. So, you know, pull into the parking lot and it's right there. You know, there's no, um, fired up my laptop and, and took care of it. So that's a little more difficult to do, right? If, if you've got to rely on getting back into the corporate network. So the cloud's driving a lot of things. And frankly, it was pretty convenient to be able to do that. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, it, it, so that's a great question, right? And, and almost every web application today is secured with SSL. So there wasn't any really need for me to get on a VPN because I wasn't getting back to a corporate asset, right? The Salesforce connection is by, by nature secure. And in fact, just a little tangential comment, um, if you look at a lot of our businesses with service providers um, and understand what's going on in their network, and as a subscriber to the service provider, right, those service providers want to know a lot about us so that they can market more effectively to us. Well, one of the things that they 
would love to be able to do is understand the patterns of what we do and where we go and all those sorts of things. Well, that's much more difficult now because of that very reason is because everything's encrypted on a web page. You know, if you look at the browser, most of the time it's an HTTPS connection. So it's all encrypted, you know, to begin with. So wasn't too worried about it, um, but, um, but it worked out well. So I touched on some of these, but I mean, what are the, what are the really things you got to go think about? So now as you start to, to think about how do you go to the cloud, and we'll talk about there's different types, because I, I know when I started thinking about cloud, I think uh, it's all public. It's Amazon Web Services, or it's Microsoft Azure, and it's that, you know, that that's a great example, right? Because it's out there for everybody, easy to get to, unsecure, all those sorts of things. And so there are things that you have to think about, right? Particularly if you're thinking about it from the data center, from your data center and your user's perspective, because now you got everything going out the WAN and potentially coming back, not only from the corporate entity, but from remotely. So you got to think about if you've got a, a big enough pipe, right? The good news there is bandwidth is becoming cheaper every day, and if you if you can't hardly, at least where I, when I read stuff in the in the press, you can't hardly you know read an article in the telecom sector without some other service provider turning up gigabit service. So that's all over the place, right? So bandwidth is a pretty is a relatively inexpensive commodity. Security is a great question. Uh, one of the things that we do in another area of my business is um, provide cloud managed Wi-Fi and absolutely got to be secure, right? I mean, it's, you sort of have a honeypot out there for everybody where you have your Wi-Fi server. So, you know, you got to think about intrusion protection, you know, all those sorts of things to wrap around that service to really make it as secure in the cloud as it was, you know, when it was in your data center. Um, LAN performance, you know, the wireless aspect of it, really more critical. In, you know, you sort of on the LAN have infinite bandwidth, relatively speaking. So the wireless performance becomes more and more important. You know, with the last wireless standard, the first 802.11ac standard, you really got to the point where you could really run your run your organization off wireless and do it pretty effectively, right? I mean, before 802.11ac technology, which is gigabit Wi-Fi, it, it was great and it worked okay, mostly supplemental technology. But now, what we see a lot is more and more people, especially in a new facility or a retrofit, it's mostly wireless from a connectivity perspective um, because it is so good. Um, and there's a couple of other, you know, there's a couple of things that are inherently better about the cloud, disaster recovery and reliability, right? I mean, think about, I was talking with the Microsoft Azure guys the other day, and they said, we have the biggest fiber network in the world of anybody that we built and we own, all right? So you can imagine the connectivity they have and the data centers that they have all across the world that we'd be really hard pressed to, to rep replicate. So, you know, God forbid something happens to what is what you've designated as your primary data center. There's six others around the world that, you know, with with um, you know 10 gig connections, you move immediately to the other, and most likely you don't even know it. So there's a lot of great things about that um, access uh, and the cloud to to really uh, really take advantage of. So, you know, the ability to spin up things, the elastic nature. Some of these themes we'll talk about more and more as we progress through here. So what's happening, right? Not surprisingly, it's growing like crazy. Um, huge growth year over year. I mean, to go from, to double from 2015 in the span of four years, I mean, we're already into that, is a big number, right? So there's no doubt about it, it's here to stay. Um, I'll talk about some other trends, I'll give you some examples, <coughs> excuse me, in, in other industries too. But it's definitely here to stay. And I'm sure as a group of IT folks, software-defined networking, Network function virtualization, SDN, NFE kinds of technology, right, in the forefront of your mind, or at least you have an awareness about it, totally in line with what we're talking about here. I mean, that's one of the big drivers for it. Um, Amazon Web Services, I picked that, I'll, I'll use that as an example, this information pretty readily available at AWS. Huge growth, and as I said before, I think I single-handedly keep Amazon in business, not so much with AWS, but it's the biggest, it's the most profitable segment in their business, right? And think about where those guys started however many years ago. They were selling books, right? Shipping them out of Seattle to wherever you were, and they've grown that over business. And AWS came out of the technology that they developed to serve themselves. And now it's, it's the most successful thing by far that they have, and it will continue to grow. And, you know, sort of traditional industry kind of guys, Microsoft and others, or trying to catch up with them because they started late. And they've all got good offerings, um, but it gives you a sense of, of really, 
you know, it's growing. And you can, this is probably, I'm sure it's almost impossible for you to read, but, and at first when I looked at this, I thought, well, gee, the scale is kind of, <coughs> kind of big there. It really goes from about just roughly 20 to 30 percent there. So the budget focus in almost any area of government is actually sitting right here, is absolutely there. All right, somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of overall budgets are focused on cloud services this year. If I were to have clicked the next year, it shifts, everything shifts up a little bit. Um, so they're absolutely growing in almost every segment that you can, you can think of. One of the things that's a little, it's sort of interesting, the first one is retail banking. You, know, you think about, at least when we talk to some of the banking customers, right, those guys probably like you or, you know, have Uber security requirements for obvious reasons. And for that segment of the industry to be the one that's leading the pact, you know that it's a pretty secure uh, way to go, right? Big, um, obviously, big security concern. So what's driving it? It's, we've talked a little bit about this, but it's it's all the applications. It's virtual desktop, uh, big file transfers. You know, that's all over the place. Other examples, medical industry, or even perhaps with you guys with, you know, opportunities or needs to move satellite imaging around, right? Not small files. A lot of big data. Uh, to use and a lot of analytics to be to be garnered from all that stuff and so much easier to put compute resources in the cloud that are elastic that you can scale up and down as you need to rather than have some fixed asset within the data center that you got to maintain and much harder to to um, to upgrade so you know very intensive um, very intensive amount of compute and bandwidth resources and, and it's really Changed all of us and how we how we work and how we think about working uh, because of the ability to push so much into the cloud and become elastic. It's really us driving it, right? Think about in your own organization over the last pick almost any time period, you know, in the last few years, how much growth you've seen, and particularly in these things, right? Um, there's so much more mobile connectivity that we demand. I mean, the biggest growth areas are. Or, or mobile type things or IP kinds of things. And so, and even a lot now, you know, my Mac is a great example. Any any handheld you have is another great example. You, you can't, there, there's no way to plug an Ethernet port really into a lot of these devices, right? So you've got to have some way to get into the network so the wireless infrastructure becomes a much more important component of this whole cloud computing initiative because most of the devices that are coming out, most of what's driving the growth most of back if you think back to the whole IP v6 sort of transition of a few years ago most of what drove that was the explosion of these wireless devices we're running out of IP addresses because we you know there's a hockey stick growth of of other kinds of devices that need IP connectivity so it's that it's you know numbers of employees it's guests right think about every one of us in the hotel here um, usually when I'm doing a wireless focus presentation I'll ask this question but I'll ask you guys also um, how many of you, when you traveled here, brought more than two uh, devices with Wi-Fi? I did. Laptop phone, yeah. More than three? Yeah. Good. Four? Yeah, you're the man. Five? All right, yeah. So that's pretty common. You know, and particularly if you start thinking about getting all that connectivity back and particularly think about LAN and wireless infrastructure, you're not thinking about, I don't know, I counted, but shortly before we got started, there were 15, 20 people. There's probably 30 or so people in here now. Uh, you're not counting the number of people anymore to get onto the network, and particularly a wireless network. You're counting the number of people times about three. Um, so, you know, if we had this room filled up, I usually look around and see if I can see the wireless access point in some of these rooms. It's probably above the tile in here. But, you know, if we filled this room up with people, you know, the, the number of people and really the number of devices in this room today probably are sufficient with a single access point. But if we filled this room up, there's no way, and each of us had a device and we were, you know, some amount of usage and so forth, there's no way a single access point would, would take care of this to, to, to satisfy the demands that we have to, to get onto the cloud. So there's a lot of areas we touched on the wireless land, big area of growth, but really focused on starting to think about, all right, so now we've got this explosive growth in a couple of dimensions, one from a bandwidth perspective, one from a perspective of users and how many people we need to get on the network. And now there becomes more and more opportunities because the, you know, the role of the IT organization has changed a little bit. If I look at our own organization, 
we've started to make a pretty substantial shift to cherry picking opportunities to go find somebody else to manage different pieces of the business so that our own IT team can focus on more application kinds of things. And one of the great opportunities for that is the network infrastructure because there's a lot of opportunity to go outsource that. Um, you know, routers and switches fairly, you know, easy to go outsource with wireless. There's still a little bit of black magic to it. Um, we'll talk about some of those things coming up. But, you know, in the networking space, as you might imagine, the wireless is the biggest growing segment. And so if you can offset that, that's also an area where the technology is changing more rapidly than anything else. If you can offset that and find somebody that can help you keep up with that, because ultimately it's going to be me as the customer of you from an IT department that's pushing you to keep up with it, with everything else you got to do, it's going to be hard to do that. And so look for ways that you can um, look for ways that you can do that. There's generally a few different types that you'll. Uh, I'll sound like a little bit of a broken record as we progress through the slide because I'm going to talk about this a couple of times. But there's different types of cloud cloud services and lots of AAS kinds of abbreviations. Infrastructure as a service, compute as a service, platform as a service, software as a service. So we're all sound the same, a little bit different. Uh, infrastructure as a service really is stuff like the networking side of things, right? Can you outsource that? Can you do something where you can find uh, that you can shift from a CapEx budget to an OpEx budget? Can you look for ways as you're developing or being driven to develop applications where you can leverage a platform in the cloud to do that, where you're not setting up development environments for your internal customers? Can you host things in the cloud, my salesforce.com example is a, is a great one for that, right? That's a software as a service, easy software as a service example, and there's lots more of those kinds of things. So, you know, almost every segment there uh, is growing some more uh, or less than the others, but, you know, infrastructure uh, as a service for sure, one of the, the bigger growth areas happening. If you think about cloud, I, I was, when I first started thinking about all the cloud service stuff, I, I would... I would always think about something like a Microsoft Azure or, or AWS, right? This public cloud infrastructure, you can go to their website, sign up, and three minutes later, you're up and going. And in the beginning, that was true. And I think part of the, part of the hesitation that we as a technology-focused group of folks had on that was, well, all right, it's this big internet-based public cloud thing. Lots of people have access to it. A little bit concerned about security. That's changed. But... And, and that's really what we would have thought of at the time as public cloud, but that's not the only game in town. So, you know, you can certainly go do that, but you could also set up a private cloud. You could set up a hybrid between the two. So private cloud, anybody using um, voice over IP? So, I mean, you could kind of think about it, and, and our, our industry is interesting because we put these fancy names around technologies that have been around for a long time. You know, if you've been using VoIP for pick any amount of time, you know, five, six, ten years, I would have told you, well, you've been using you've been using cloud technology, you've been using private cloud technology for then, right? Because you've got a centralized voice over IP server sitting somewhere and you've got your endpoints or the IP phones. Well that's a good example of a private cloud. Right? You could set that up within the network and still it's a cloud focused technology. You're sort of but you're doing it in your own data center. The public cloud is a is an obvious example. That we've talked about before, and the hybrid is just that. It's a mix of the two. You know, maybe you've got some resources in your own IT data center that's your primary server and your backup is in the cloud somewhere. So, you know, great example of, uh, of a resilient type network, right? You still have 100% control and can scale it as you see fit in your own data center, but then you can kick it over to the cloud uh, should, something, should something fail from a disaster perspective. And you can't hardly talk about a cloud presentation without talking about Internet of Things, right? It's, it's everywhere. And while there's not a specific government bullet here or box here, I think you could imagine almost all of those areas overlaying, you know, into what you guys, what you guys do. Um, you know, lighting is a great example. is one of the biggest drivers so far for Internet of Things in your home. Think about the explosion of, of, um, of technology to automate your home. Right, I mean, Google's coming out with stuff. Google with their OnHub, Amazon, uh, Amazon with their Echo, um, Apple with HomeKit. You know, I've seen appliances with internet connectivity, TV. I mean, it's all over the place, right? Projectors, you, you can't hardly turn around. So 
that's going to drive into other areas of business as well. And so you're going to see this big growth that's going to make this problem um, even more uh, more apparent and, and have the cloud really be the right answer to, to go solve it. So not surprisingly, big data is what's driving it, right? There's so much data. Almost any industry at this point, there's so much data in there. And we want to do things with it, right? We want to mine the data. We want to analytics in my world is a huge thing right now in almost any segment that we talk about. We look at service providers and they want to know analytics about their network. They want to know analytics about subscribers and so forth. And you just can't do that in, you know, a pizza box appliance sitting in your data center because you're not going to be able to keep up. And so, you know, the benefit of the cloud there is you can have some elastic type connectivity. Social networks, you know, arguably in a business world, maybe less focused on that than, you know, in our personal lives, but still a pretty healthy focus of, you know, businesses with Twitter feeds and Facebook pages and, and those sorts of things as a mechanism to, uh, to communicate. You know, our own um, in Huntsville, uh, you know, as an example, our own law enforcement community uses Twitter feeds to, you know, push out pretty rapid updates to us when, you know, when something's going on or, you know, whatever may be happening. So it, it's really all over the place. There's an app for everything. Um, you know, you can... Just think about your own life and think about even from a business perspective, you know, we're, companies are develop, developing applications, you know, we're developing apps for our customer base, we're developing apps for our internal consumption to arm our sales team with things. So that's all driving it because we are, we're all carrying these things around and it's a great platform to be able to get back and, and connect to things. And then the explosive growth of data centers and the software-defined everything, software-defined networking, we talked about that in the beginning. One of the things I'll give you an example of in, in, in that is if you look at what service providers are doing, you know, the biggest of the big service providers, you think those guys kind of typically slow to move and, you know, not really at all that responsive and so forth. Well, that's a very different situation right now. Every one of those guys is doing something. They're changing the way they think about their network architecture. And there's a term in our industry called CORD, C-O-R-D, Central office reimagined or rearchitected as a data center is 100% about those guys changing the way that they do business so that they can become more responsive to us, right? Taking it out of the traditional infrastructure where they own everything, put all the equipment in there, and really taking that old legacy central office look and feel and dropping it into more of a data center type approach. It makes them more nimble, more scalable, and that is absolutely happening um, at breakneck speed. So. Um, you, know, you think about guys that are, you would maybe in your mind think are kind of laggards from a technology perspective. Um, a lot of those guys are really on the forefront of, of this kind of a technology uh, right now. So I'm going to advance my animation here. Um, so what's driving it, right? It's, it's, it's this sort of multi-axis growth. It's us as consumers bringing our own devices you know, you talk to different different types of companies and you ask them, or even educational organizations, you know, do you supply the device? Do you let people bring your own devices? Adrian's a good example. It's a little bit of a both, a little bit of both. Um, I bought my own device and I'll put our uh, security technology on it that containerizes my access to Adrian's information, right? I prefer the device I bought. Um, so we're all bringing our devices, you know, I, I um, I have access with my iPhone, I have access with my tablet, I have uh, my laptop, I have access with my tablet. So it's really, you know, so that's one dimension of scaling the, the number of businesses or the number of locations that have become distributed, not even necessarily a business, right? But, you know, think about all the people that work remotely or out in the field somewhere and still need access um, to uh, that connectivity. Um, there's a company in Huntsville, you guys may be familiar with it, called Gator. Um, they make what I would describe as kind of a big beach ball with a satellite dish on it, right? Some of you are shaking your head. No, I mean, that's a great example, right? Rapidly deploy that. That's super cool technology. Rapidly deploy that in a really portable way anywhere in the world, right? And so you've got that dimension of scaling, too. So it's not even necessarily, I got an office somewhere. I got an office in the middle of the desert wherever I want it. So you have that, and then you've got all this data. And so you've got this sort of multi-dimensional scaling problem. And really the only way to go solve that is to start thinking about what pieces of your network that you can really start to outsource. Networking is a great example of one. Some of the security technologies are a good example. Applications are a good example. 
And so if you look at where people are really, and again, I'm going to apologize for some of these slides that are going to be hard to read, uh, but I think you guys have access to the slides. If you look at what people are really doing and thinking about outsourcing, it's almost every aspect of what an IT organization is doing. And interestingly, security, there's a couple of them. There's security products and security services are two of the biggest areas, which you might at first think is counterintuitive, but it ought to shed some light on the fact that it really is a secure service. There's a lot of managed security companies that provide a cloud-based service that work very, very well. And they provide it in a manner where, you know, if you think about, um, you know, what an incident response typically might be to an event that happened, you know, it's a lot of hours and a lot of expense and a lot of labor to go figure out what happened, right? So if you've got all that in the cloud, you've got a team of experts in the cloud that can go manage that. So it's a great way to move, uh, move things around and be much more flexible, stay on the cutting edge, if not the bleeding edge of technology where you're not having to keep up with it all the time. So other areas of that, um, we'll talk about some of these, but green IT um, and virtualization is one. Um, there's a couple of them on here that say uh, basically something related to, to applications moving and then network services is another one, one we talked about before, right? Can you outsource the management of your LAN, WAN, and wireless networks to somebody else um, so that you can go focus on uh, on the technology at hand. You know, most of the time when I'm talking to a group of people, and unless you guys are different, I'll expect you to have the same answer. Nobody's got a, you know, nobody's got extra people sitting around looking for something to do. You know, I got 10 pounds of stuff I got to put in a two pound sack. And so if you can find a way to offload some of that where it makes sense, it's a great opportunity to do that and really focus your staff uh, on things that, that really need to belong uh, to you guys. Again, I told you I'd be a little bit of a broken record, and here I go again. And just the shift and what people are really looking at, a little different data source here, but gives you the same kind of a kind of a sense. You know, the blue is I've got it now, the dark color is I'm considering it. And so, you know, you can see across this was actually a snapshot, this um, particular um, analyst organization could slice and dice the data a lot of different ways. This actually we we ticked the government box. Uh, and excluded everything else. So, you know, it gives you a lot of sense about, well, all right, people are are doing stuff already really in earnest and still have plans to continue doing that, whether it's, you know, private cloud. We talked about that before, platform, software, infrastructure as a service, or that hybrid. And that's really true, and we see that a lot. There's less hybrid concept today. Um, you know, people tend to either be all, all in private data center or all in private cloud or all in public cloud and less hybrid, but as you can see, that's, that's, that's starting to grow because I think a lot of the, the data center guys are realizing, well, that's a good model, too, for them. And so that particular aspect of it has got a little more complexity to it than all one way or the other, um, but you'll start to see that, and there's a lot of benefit to, to having to do that. So what are some of the benefits? Well, cost is one. Cost is one that people often think is the only one, uh, which really isn't true. Um, but... You know, it's really a, there's a lot of things in our world today that are moving to a consumption-based model. And, you know, a lot of times you think, well, it's going to be more expensive. Well, that flexes both ways, right, is as you need more, you can get it immediately. I mean, literally with a few keystrokes and mouse clicks, you can go in and ratchet up your bandwidth, ratchet up your compute power, ratchet up almost any aspect of your cloud-based service and get to that. Uh, limit. Same same is true on the other direction, right? You can ratchet it down as you need to, although most of the time we're all thinking about cranking it up. Um, from an energy efficiency standpoint, you know, think, oh, well, you got all this power requirement, uh, which is one thing, but the other aspect of that is because you, you can save in that area as well because not only are you reducing your power consumption, you're also reducing your cooling footprint. So that's something that people don't think about a lot is, you know, I got all this stuff in a fairly confined space. I can do something to cool it. Um, from an availability standpoint, you know, most, most IT organizations' networks are pretty good in terms of availability. I mean, I can think within our own network over the years a couple of times when I really haven't been able to get to it, even when um, in North Alabama we had back in 2007 a pretty – horrendous set of tornadoes that came through um, that were pretty devastating um, from, uh, from about the middle of the state up. 
And Adtran stayed in business. We were one of the few companies that kept rolling. I mean, literally our manufacturing guys didn't miss a beat because they had a pretty solid disaster recovery plan. They knew how to go get diesel for our generators and all those sorts of things. But not everybody is that way, and we still relied on things that were in the cloud. You know, if, if our data center had been wiped out, if the tornado, God forbid, had hit our building and wiped out our data center, we couldn't have done that without some kind of plan to go shift everything around in the cloud, right? And so that's another important piece. I'll skip, a, skip around a little bit. Um, from a re reliability and agility perspective, right, you want to go find cloud providers that have geographically diverse locations. We've talked to some small guys where we're looking to leverage some data center technology and some products that we're releasing and there, you know, there was one in, you know, in, in Birmingham, Alabama and the other in, in sort of middle Mississippi. Well, that's not really geographic redundancy, right? Because most of the weather patterns kind of come through. So you want an east coast, west coast or a, you know, something like that that gives you some true geographic uh, diversity. Um, from an agility perspective, it's easy to, you know, easier to make upgrades. A lot of the, a lot of the service providers offer ways to take that burden off your hand, right? Keep all the latest patches, and that's, as you probably know, not an insignificant task, right? To keep up with all the latest patches, security, uh, and so forth, um, patches, and this, and very similarly from a security perspective, right? The latest and greatest cutting edge security technology, more readily available than any of us can keep up with unless that is something that we are myopically focused on in our life. So leverage the ability to do sorts of those sorts of things. The other thing I'll mention, and I'll focus this a little bit on some of the wireless and LAN kinds of technologies, is it's a great way to offload some of the operational expense, right? Find somebody else that can do the pieces that aren't your core business. Absolutely, you got to have these kinds of things, but particularly if you're you know, starting up a new facility and you need wireless connectivity, it, it's, it's, it's a much more difficult proposition, right, than we're kind of accustomed to in our own home, right? We go down to Best Buy or wherever, buy an access point, throw it up in our house, and it works great. And so a lot of times people think, well, I can take that same kind of thought process and go get 50 more, and then I've got the Marriott's Convention Center taken care of. Mm, no. Uh, there's a whole lot more to consider in those kinds of environments, and particularly when you get into an environment where there's a dense population, right, a, a dense office environment or, um, you know, housing, those kinds of things. You've got to really go think about what that plan looks like. And so find experts that can, you can carve out pieces of your business to help with your staffing issues uh, to, uh, to enable you to leverage some of those technologies. So some of the specific things... Um, so going on, you know, as I said in the beginning, when I look across a lot of different industries, the reasons for moving to the cloud are surprisingly similar, right? It's, it's a lot of the reasons I talked about before. In this industry, or this segment of the market is really not any different um, whatsoever. And again, looking at the three types, the three most common types of as a service kinds of things, again, focused in on government budget allocation, it's pretty similar across the board. So, I mean, there's without a doubt that it's going. And a lot of you, I suspect, have um, heard about this Cloud First initiative that's coming out of the U.S. CIO, right? And it's, it's, it doesn't say, at least to my understanding, it doesn't say you have to go do it. It says where it meets certain criteria from a security and availability and cost perspective and so forth, you should go look at that first because it, there really are a lot of inherent benefits to that. We'll talk about some of those coming up. but. I mean, it really is all over the place, and it really is a very good solution. Um, if you think about what some of those reasons are that's driving it, it's consolidation of resources, right? It's, you know, instead of having seven different, different you know, data centers all over the place, consolidate all that, leverage the cost savings of that, um, be more reactive, uh, share services between organizations, uh, something we've started to do. Um, I'll, I'll use... Um, use us as an example of that within our own product organization and IT organization, we've got a pretty tight collaboration and leverage each other uh, in each other's data center opportunities to really make the organization much more flexible. And that's what the cloud really, really affords you. Now, there's uh, anybody familiar with the show Mythbusters? Yeah, uh, yeah I like that show. Uh, so here's my Mythbusters slide. So there's a lot of perceptions about cloud, some of which I talked about in the beginning. 
where it's all about lower cost or it's all about moving mission critical applications to a place that's not safe or secure or you're going to lose control of all your data um, or moving to the cloud automatically means virtualization or my favorite is it, when everything moves to the cloud it works better well not really right I mean all those are sort of not really I'm going to bust the myth now um, not everything is a good fit for the cloud right you got to understand that there is probably a cost savings for you but you got to understand where it is right it's it's being able to adapt and move faster it's being able to leverage and really use the resources that you only need that you need rather than you know have some pool of resources out there that in your own data center that you may not really be fully utilizing um, it's looking for secure connectivity right I mean just because you move something to the cloud doesn't make it any more or less secure you still got to know what you're doing from a security perspective because you've got to be able to go to that cloud provider and say okay these are the kinds of things that I need right or engage an expert that might be on their staff to help you determine those kinds of things you lose control of your data well not really I mean unless you've done something to make that in insecure then okay but I don't think any of us are, 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 are planning to do that just because you've moved it into a data center somewhere doesn't again make it inherently someone else's the virtualization is a technology that's part of the cloud but it's not the cloud right there's great benefits to virtualization and it's one of the key technologies that particularly in the disaster recovery aspect that people use very easy to move virtual machines from one data center to to the to the next at the flip of a switch rather than have to go move physical servers so absolutely part of it it's an enabler but it's not the cloud by itself right and and then finally everything works better in the cloud well not really I mean if you if you have lousy practices to begin with and you take lousy practices and move them to the cloud well now you have cloud-based lousy practices so you still got to know what you're doing um, just moving to the cloud doesn't doesn't necessarily um, make it better. So, continuing to think about you know keep talking about costs. I mean that's one of the things that people really zero in on, and it may or may not be, you know, cheaper. You really got to look at it and say, yeah, okay, it is, but the cost isn't everything, right? It might be a little bit more expensive for you to do it, but the benefits that you get, the intrinsic benefits that you get out of it from a scalability perspective, ability to react and so forth, uh, may be significantly better than, than what you have now. I mean, certainly, I think anybody would be hard pressed to argue that from a, an availability or a volume of data that's going to the cloud and a connectivity perspective, that any one IT organization can keep up with that with everything else that they have to do. Right? That's what these guys are doing. Is their whole focus is make our life easier and allow us to have an elastic service so that when we need more internet bandwidth going into it when we need more storage when we need more uh, this or that that then it's available um, to us to to get the other aspect of it is you know from a platform perspective the cloud service providers you know have the same platforms that we're all using right obviously the prevalent ones are are Microsoft platform and some flavor of Linux um, all those are out there readily available I'll keep I'll use AWS as an example you can go out to their you know, website and Azure is same. Uh, well, Azure is a little different, but AWS, you know, you can pick any flavor of Linux you want. Uh, a lot of different OS choices and get that, you know, get a VM spun up like that. And so it's easy to do that um, and do it in a manner that's, um, that's very secure. So I actually pulled this slide. I actually was, uh, was um, <laughs> Jim and I unknowingly I had breakfast together this morning. I was uh, sitting at the table next to him and you'll probably remember that I had my laptop sitting there and I was actually doing a little preparation for this and one of the things I was doing was I grabbed a slide out of a um, out of a, um, a document that was published by the, the um, US CIO and I thought it was pretty good because it sort of summarized now and then you know a lot of us uh, sometimes struggle with change and the just be honest let's be honest with each other the whole move to the cloud that's a pretty big change a pretty fundamental shift in the way that we as IT folks have to think about our business and so I thought this was really good because it sort of compared and contrasted well what are the you know sort of whatever whatever what are we doing now from a cloud perspective and what have we done 
right? So you get better u utilization of, of assets. You're only using what you need, you know, versus potentially I've either got way more headroom than I need to think about growth or I'm out of space. I almost never have kind of the perfect amount. Um, you can aggregate demand, combine things together where it makes sense, right? Again, more efficient utilization of those re resources. Improve the productivity, right? As the needs of us as the consumers change, it's easy to scale, right? It's agile. Um, a lot of great choices out there from a cloud service provider. I've talked about Azure and, and um, in AWS a lot, not so much to endorse any one of them, but those are ones that we all probably can relate to and hear about a lot. Um, and it's easy, they flex, right? You can, you can have almost instantaneous response. There's no way that in a, in a non-cloud environment you would take, right? And especially if you started to go build your own data center, years and years and years to go do that, lots of things to consider. How is it hardened? Um, a lot of different things to go do that. So there's really no way you're gonna, you're gonna keep up with that. And then from an innovation perspective, you know, you're really shifting the focus from owning particular assets to a service, right? It's no different than, you know, if you're a, a cable customer today or, you know, um, XM radio, right? I mean, you, you're, your, your cable box you're most likely paying a few bucks a month for, and you don't really care what the box is. You don't really care if it breaks. It's not your really responsibility, right? It's the responsibility of the provider to go fix that. Same is true in this sort of environment. And so, you know, go, go offload um, all those things that give you the ability to re really focus in and not burden yourself by having to go manage those particular assets, right? Take some of those sort of mundane things off your plate so that your staff can go focus on things that really better align you to what your business needs or what your operational needs really are. So is it right for you? Not always. I think there's a tremendous compelling advantage. I think there's probably more benefit than not. I would probably argue that probably most of us would be hard pressed to find things in our organization that are not benefited by the cloud, right? I mean, we all have resource constraints. There's no doubt about it. Anybody, uh, I'd be shocked if anybody in this room raised their hands. I don't have resource constraints of some kind or another. It's just not, it's just not there. Um, we probably all have to think about, well, how do I, you know, in a distributed workforce or a distributed team, how do we make sure that everybody's got the same access, the same quality of experience? How do we keep up with the growth uh, of both technology and access to data and do it wherever we are and make sure that we're experts in all these areas, right? It's, it's very difficult to do. Um, now, there may be some reason why you have, you know, some sort of a legislative restriction or some kind of an, uh, a restriction from a security perspective that says absolutely no way, no how uh, can you put this data. But, you know, if you think back to one of those charts in the beginning where we segmented out the market, there's kind of classic industries where they're sort of all into the cloud or pretty significantly into the cloud. So you guys may have some specialized requirements that say that there are things that don't really fit, and that's great. You know, by no means does it have to be an all-in or not. And in fact, most people aren't. Most people is, are, are pretty selective about the pieces that they go take um, and do it in a manner that, um, that really makes sense for that organization. So what do you do to go figure it out, right? It's almost the same, same kinds of things you do with any problem, right? Go look at it and figure out what makes sense to move. Because it's, as I said, it's not generally going to be an all or nothing, right? Where are you lacking in capability or where do you have capability that you want to be able to leverage, you know, those, those people or those assets somewhere else and can go offload that particular aspect of your organization to somewhere else. The next one is what I just said, right? It's not an all or nothing. How can you, how can you pick and choose and cherry pick the things that make sense, right? Start with the low hanging fruit, try that out, get some comfort with it, and expand from there. And do it over a period of time where, you know, you're looking a little bit longer, right? Maybe not just the first year, because you know, first year you may have a, some cost that, you know, to kind of get started, because you've got some of the assets and now you're transitioning. So look over a period of time and really figure out where it makes sense, because I think what you'll find is that uh, there are a lot of areas where where cloud can provide you a very elastic uh, and secure uh, approach to, to different aspects of your business. So 
with that, I had a couple questions along the way, but I'll be happy to spend some more time to uh, answer other questions. Yeah, so I think your question is, can, does the cloud help you benefit from a continuous operation perspective? And yeah, sure, because um, you know, pick almost any location for a data center. If that goes down, particularly with almost any cloud provider, you've got one or more alternative locations. You know, one that you've probably designated as your as your backup site. But you know, even if something happens there, there's a tremendous amount of flexibility to go move your data around as you as you need to, or even not so much move it. But if you had a situation where the access to that data center uh, was removed for some reason, you know, all of those guys have different providers, different, you know, connectivities, you know, they literally have, if you've ever uh, had the benefit of going into a couple of pretty major data centers, and if you look at the way they physically laid out their data center, right, they've got infrastructure, power, and network literally coming in from different physical sides of the, of the building um, and look at, you know, terrain and other things as part of where they go, and they spend a lot of time uh, also looking at weather patterns and natural disasters and those kinds of things to pick um, locations. Interestingly, um, Google is developing a data center in what is arguably very rural North Alabama, Stevenson, Alabama. I'm, I'm sure no one has heard of that, um, but it's just up, it's probably um, 30 or 40 minutes south of Chattanooga, Tennessee. Like, why in the world would they pick that, right? I mean, it's not like there's some big, dense population of tech folks there. Well, the whole reason they picked it was because from, um, you know, from a weather pattern perspective and, and those sorts of things, turns out they don't have a lot of problems. And so, you know, check that box, and then everything else builds into that facility. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's one of the great inherent things about it, I think. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I'll give you, I'll give you a great example. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, and, and that's, you know, that, that, so that's a great question, right? Is, is there sort of any hidden cost or how, what do you do? Well, that, and that was sort of kind of one of the last points there. I'll, again, I'll use us as an example. You know, you'd think for a technology company, we'd be sort of on the leading edge of all of these things. But our IT organization, much like I would expect you guys, has had a lot of other things to do and keep up with and not the staff. Well, we have had the same ERP system for I don't know how long, uh, probably since I was you know, knee-high to a grasshopper. And now we've gone through this big um, RFP pr process, and what we concluded is that we're going to go from you know, this sort of early 90s era ERP system that's 100% in our data center. I mean, good luck getting access to it remotely in any kind of method that's not painful to 100% cloud-based approach. And so that's a huge shift, right, in mentality. And yeah, there's, a, there's an expense associated with doing that without a doubt. But the interesting thing that we found, and you know, you can imagine that's a multi-million dollar project. What we found is that there's a very, very, very fast payback once, you know, we'll go spend that however many millions of dollars it was. And I think what we projected was, I don't know, somewhere around a 12-month payback for that just because of the benefits of the system provided, the ability to get to it wherever we need to, the ability to react and scale. So, I mean, yeah, it, it may cost you a little bit to do it. It will cost you a little bit to do it. But, you know, in many, many cases, the payback is very quick to do that.
Yeah, yeah so a good question about risk. So, uh, you know, I would argue that the risks are not inherently different than trying to stand it up in your own data center. Uh, because, you know, you, you really still, you've really got to, I think there was a, one of my bullets was um, something to the effect of, you know, just moving to the cloud doesn't make it this or that, right? Well, moving to the cloud doesn't inherently make it more or less secure. You still got to know what you're doing, right? I mean, I can't go stand up an application in the cloud, just go move to the cloud and I'm done because I'm now I have, you know, most likely just made myself a nice honeypot and a great target, right? I've still got to have the same security thought processes. Now, there's probably and is in most of these uh, cloud data center providers a tremendous amount of resource that's 100% focused on security. That's all they do, right, for obvious reasons. And so what you allow yourself to do if you don't have that skill set or you know, you're not comfortable with the level of that skill set that you have, then you have that opportunity to go leverage that and say, okay, look, here's, here's what I got now. I feel like it's pretty secure. I can't be any less secure. There's a lot of advantages that I see to moving the cloud from elasticity and those sorts of things, reliability, disaster recovery. But if I do that, I can't be any less secure or let's go work together to do it. So you still got to, you know, it's not a throw it over the fence and be done kind of thing. And so, you know, if you go in with a bad plan, you're going to have a bad solution. That's just the reality of it. So you, you do, you know, have to think about how do I make it secure, just like you were going to do it, you know, with your, in your own network. The benefit, however, is that you've got a lot of other resources in almost all these cloud providers. I was talking to, I don't remember who it was. I've talked to some, several of them. But they all tend to have these subject matter experts, particularly on the, you know, on the front end, right? You get the, the, you know, the salespeople and their their sales engineer that kind of have the general knowledge of what they can do and the flexibility. And then in almost any piece of what they offer, there's some subject matter expert. So, you know, they were bringing in. In my case, we we were asking some very specific things about security, having learned a couple of lessons, unfortunately, the hard way. Um, and so they'd bring in the different experts, and so that's. That's a big benefit. A couple of questions. I think we're almost out of time here, so maybe one more if anybody has it, and happy to hang around for a few minutes. All right. Well, thanks for your time today, guys. Appreciate it.